dishwasher and a cooktop. On-site laundry facilities are also available for extended stays at pet-friendly My Place Hotels. Book your stays online at MyPlaceHotels.com, My Place Hotels, St. George, and West Jordan, Utah. Make My Place your place. The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the program's participants and do not necessarily reflect those of station staff, management, and advertisers. It's time for the most interactive radio program in Las Vegas today. It's time for Pushing the Limits with Brian Shapiro. Brian will talk sports, politics, entertainment, and anything that matters to you. Feel free to call Brian at 702-221-7283. You want answers? I want the truth! Now, Pushing the Limits, here's Brian Shapiro. What's up, Las Vegas? Happy Friday. It is Pushing the Limits time. Glad you could be with us as we're broadcasting on KSHP on the AM radio dial. Also broadcasting live with the video feed on our YouTube page, on the Facebook fan page, on my personal Twitter page, Pushing Limits LV, so you can see why I have a face for radio. That's right, folks. We're going to have a lot of fun today. On this Friday, it's been a long week for me. You know, I'm on this new testosterone therapy. As, as Numchuck knows, I'm always complaining and sore and raging. So I'm hoping to hit the golf ball 400 yards tomorrow on the golf course. I'm playing with JT the Brick, who does uh, TV for the Raiders. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, I hate to say it, but today is, uh, in a way, anti-abortion day. Uh, an over, a really uh, a sad day, as Joe Biden said. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the show, but uh, I just think it's dangerous times we're living in now, uh, being taken over by the alt-right. But anyway, we'll get to that later on in the show. Brian Salmon in hour number two, Channel 3 Sports, is going to be joining us. we got a lot to talk about with him, including Chris Bryant in town playing AAA baseball for Albuquerque against the Aviators. He's 0 for 6. Is he going to get a hit? One of the best hitters in baseball can't get a hit in, in the minors. So we'll talk about that. Uh, coming up with Brian Salmon, a little Aces talk with him, a little Raiders talk with him. we got a lot to get to today. And as I said, we'll get to the abortion talk coming up here in hour number two. But the guy joining me in studio right now, I've known him for a while. Uh, mutual friends we have. And he's somebody that uh, certainly I admire a lot of, of the good things he does and the philanthropist that he is. But also, uh, I'm a little scared to be around him. And I say that jokingly and somewhat serious because, well, besides he's he's a big guy, right? And he would kick my ass. But besides that... This is a guy who survived the 9-11 attacks. He was in the Twin Towers minutes before those towers collapsed. He also survived the October 1 shooting. He was at Mandalay Bay when that all took place. But as I mentioned, he's a philanthropist, uh, terrorism survivor, risk management speaker, a family man, a father, uh, you know, an autism dad, uh, and uh, just uh, a lot of respect for all the things he does with his charity work. Mike Dempsey joining us in studio. Mike, I appreciate you being here. How are Great you? Here. I appreciate, yeah. Love being in the studio. Finally, we've been doing this virtual Finally. for the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, and I have you on usually on 9-11. Yeah. And the reason why I have you on uh, on that very uh, sad, you know, anniversary day is that you experienced it. Yeah. You were in the Twin Towers. What, 20, 30 minutes before one of the towers collapsed? Crazy story. So I was at a Yankee game the night before. Uh, Roger Clemens going for his 20th win. And this is the luck of the drawer with, with just a, the game was rained out. Two and a half hour rain delay, which never happens, right? So mm -hmm. usually rain delays, they call the game 7 o'clock. This game didn't get called till like 9.30. Mm -hmm. I lived in Long Island at the time. I'm from Brooklyn, but I was living in Long Island. And it took us, uh, my wife and I, a long time to get home. The train, Long Island Railroad, missed our train. Didn't get in until 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I was up, ready for work the next day. Credit Suisse, First Boston, Five World Trade Center. My wife worked for Marsh McLennan, Tower 100 floor, but she overslept. Now, that was back when the cell phones were new. I just remember leaving for work, didn't really check. So we kind of like, you know, got split that morning. Mm -hmm. I'm in there. I got to the Trade Center about 8.30. That was usually my uh, my 7.25 train, get in 8.06, Penn Station, get downtown, E-Train, Usual routine. I'm looking at Monday Night Wrestling. It was Tuesday, 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I was internet surfing and looking at Kurt Angle, the Monday Night Wrestling, WWE Raw results. I know Kurt. Yeah, yeah I know Kurt too. Yeah, yeah. good friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, 
all of a sudden I hear this big boom. And I looked out the window and it looked like five was hit, five World Trade Center, because the plane obviously hit into one World Trade into that first tower. Were you in the other tower when the first plane hit? No, I'll explain. I'll get to that in a okay. minute. So yeah. remember, there were seven buildings. People always think of the Twin Towers. They don't right. realize the World Trade Center complex was seven buildings. They were right. all connected. Mm -hmm. uh, even seven was connected over VC Street. So, uh, but I was in five. Five was connected to one. So mm -hmm. the impact of... One world, actually, the engine of the plane landed through our uh, in five World Trade Center. We were on one of the top floors. Now, I will tell you that I didn't see the engine land. I didn't know the building was on fire. Five burned down, as you know, that day as well. Um, but we evacuated. But I had a different uh, detour because I'm. Did now, you have any idea what was going on? No, it was a bomb. I mean, boom, yeah. you know. But even that, a plane hitting, we didn't have TVs. Right. It was the old World Trade Center building didn't have good technology. Uh, so TVs were really not something that I could see what's going on. You're watching CNN, you're watching Matt Lauer, right. didn't have that kind of, so, and we had had a fire drill about a week before. Um, so I remember thinking, oh, here we go through this again. What's going on? So it was like more, but I got downstairs to the lobby, but then I took a detour, went through the mall of the world trade center to get to one world trade center, but I had to go outside first in what was called the courtyard area where they had the sphere. And that's where they had a concert set up that night. Um, Tuesday nights, they had concerts at the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. and there were chairs set up. I remember hearing boom, boom, boom. Now, I know now those were people jumping from the oh tower. Oh, Did not landing. know that. Ugh. Yeah. I went through there. It was a kind of a easy exit to get. Because that's one. where they say most of the people that were jumping were landed yeah. in that area, uh, yeah. and, and that, which is also extremely dangerous because they right. land on you. You're gone, too. Yeah. Oh. So by the time I got to into One World Trade Center lobby, it was about a, maybe a few minutes before 9 a.m. Um, and I was trying to, you know, ask the security guard, hey, I want to need to get to One World Trade, you know, upstairs. My wife's up there. Obviously, no. The glass was blown out in the lobby. That's where you knew something was fire. Did not know the extent. I didn't even know a plane hit the building. There was nobody telling, saying, hey, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. None of that. So I go out through the go back through the World Trade Center mall so i want to use my phone i just got in a cell phone about a month before i was right. pretty brand new with phones couldn't get a connection it was not working but i, I went outside there was an old radio store called sam goody mm -hmm. and i remember was, those east coast yeah yep, that was by greenwich street and liberty i mm -hmm. got out by the other side smart move because the that was on the opposite side of where the plane got hit but guess what happened i get outside i guess 9 3 a.m as I got out of those revolving doors, that this plane comes barreling right into two. Did you World hear Trade it before Center. the impact? I saw it. I didn't. You know, it's like you ever have a dream where, and the dream and the nightmare, you can't. You're frozen. Mm -hmm. You can't move. That yeah. was me walking out because you're hearing the the noise, the engine, everything right. going right into the. And I, from a reaction standpoint, I got trampled. Um, so everybody asked me what kind of debris, and it was huge. It was. People trampled me running away from that explosion. I was so right it. as seconds after the second plane hits the second tower, uh, you hear it, you don't see it, and you're being trampled. And I would imagine that is just absolute mayhem. I got knocked out. So the, you did. So the story of that is that I was knocked out. This is a guy who had multiple concussions playing football. Because you played um, college football. Yeah. You know? and you're an athlete. You know, football. Yeah. yeah. So I had like that. Um, but so I don't remember anything from till I woke up and this is the story that I never got the pieces to it. Woke up in city hall park, which is about, how did you get three. there? No idea. Somebody, somebody carried you. you think? Somebody carried a six foot three, 230 pound so guy. Somebody, somebody saved your life. Cause yes. if you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're unconscious, if you're just if someone left, if you're just left there, you would have been crushed by yeah. the buildings collapse. Correct. Right. So a coworker My found God. me, a coworker found me in city hall park about nine 30 ish. Got me over to Beekman, NYU Downtown Hospital. Yeah. Um, I got admitted there, and I was in an outdoor courtyard uh, because, remember, the hospital was getting pretty full. They had us out there, and it was about 9.59, I guess, when the Tower 2 collapsed first. And I just remember being near, we were near the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, that second tower, when it collapsed, the debris cloud came toward the Brooklyn Bridge. Right. That was just where the, uh, where you see those images on TV. Right. So... They didn't tell us. Uh, we were outdoors. There was probably four or five other people, injury victims. They're being treated. And you hear this noise. And that was the scariest part of the whole morning for me was everything went black. Um, I just had LASIK surgery uh, about a month earlier, and I felt like I was blind. How old were you and at the time? 29. So you're 
pretty young. You're a young yeah. man, and uh, you're in great shape now. I Thanks. can imagine the shape <laughs> yeah. you must have been in at 29. Yeah. You're, you're unconscious. You find yourself at this park, and you still really don't know what's happening. Yeah. Like, like the whole world is, is trying to figure it out. And then yeah. I think when the second plane hits, I think just about everybody said to themselves, okay, this is not an accident, right? right? Yep. When, I, when I first heard uh, the first plane hitting, I was in college, and I was driving uh, to school, and I'm listening to Howard Stern on mm. the radio as I did every morning, and he's talking about Pamela Anderson. And then the next thing he says, oh, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. Yeah. I'm thinking to myself, it's probably one of those two- or three-person propeller planes, right? That's right. what I'm assuming. Right. It was an accident, something along those lines. And I understand that there was a terrorist attack at the World Trade Center, the bombing that took yeah. place years back when Bill Clinton, I believe, was president. Yep. But, 93. you know, no, I wasn't thinking that at all. But then no. when that second plane hits, and then all of a sudden we have all this happening at once, we learn of a plane that goes down – uh, in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. I believe it was Shanksville, just, uh, Shanksville, Shanksville. just outside of Pittsburgh. Yeah. I'm sorry. And that was headed towards Washington. Yeah. And then right. we learned about the plane that goes down at the Pentagon. And then uh, I think we're all freaking out at that point, yeah. right? And we're thinking, oh my God, this country's under attack, right? Um, well, being in the hospital, hospital that we they put us in, uh, NYU downtown, that was really the kind of the triage. That's where everything was going on. There was also St. Vincent's in Midtown, 14th Street. They took right. a lot of people, but we didn't have TVs there. So a lot of it was thinking, what is happening? And I'll get to Vegas later on in per terms of what was different because there was social media. You knew what was going but on. But your wife, you you have to be, th oh my God, where's my wife? Is she okay? At one point, there was a detective uh, walking around for contact information and I gave her a World Trade Center number, not knowing the World Trade Center mm -hmm. was gone. Um, so did you think your wife was, was dead at that point? At one point, yeah, about three o'clock, I was like, oh, oh boy. And she thought the same with me. They couldn't find me. They looked for me and uh, they called St. Vincent's. They called, they didn't realize at which hospital I was at. And uh, it, really, it was like a piece of paper that I signed in when I was at. So, so the country is under attack. Yeah. The trade centers are gone. You don't hear from your wife. Mm -hmm. How are you even able to function? I mean, like, are you going crazy? Like, what are you, are you trying to, are you hypervent? I mean, I don't even know what I would be going through. I mean, what, what I left at, it was no, all those stuff you saw on TV, people passing out water bottles, food right in that hospital. Uh, remember it was funny story. It was, uh, at my firm, we had our meal card on yeah. our ID. Well, that was left in the world trade center, obviously. Um, I had no money, in my wallet. So I'm at this, they had a vending machine in the lobby of the hospital. And it was like, I think I had $1 left and I put the dollar in, you know, and it goes in there and the thing didn't come down, the bag of chips. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even get a bag of chips. I was dying uh, of, they had problems keeping the electricity went out. I went, so many problems that, that morning. He was uh, obviously under duress. They've been through 93, but they were not this prepared is different. for an event of that magnitude, yeah. obviously. Um, but yeah, I just remember being hungry. Like I am. And the so... first call you have with your wife or the first contact you have with her, what was that like? Actually, I didn't. My father was the person that got in contact with her and we were able to, and then I got transferred that night to Mercy Medical in Rockville Center. Cause I remember I was living in Long Island and it was over, they expected a lot more, um, victims which obviously never happened but right, i was right, transferred right. and i'll tell you mercy medical took great care of me i was there for two more days obviously head injury fractured skull internal bleeding internal bleeding took a while that was the part that lingered you know you can only imagine being i had the marks on my back because i fell face forward mm -hmm. and uh that was pretty much like you know you know playing football these sports but I was literally run over by a lot of people. But it's incredible, though. The good, the bad, the ugly. Look at the bad part of that. I got trampled. But the good part is whoever the good Samaritan that took me to safety. You, you, and, under, and to this day, you have no idea. No idea. And I was under the impact of the, gosh, of the plane. So that's how lucky and, I was to be oh, gosh. here right now talking to you. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, and you're reunited with your wife. Your wife made yep. it out okay. Uh, incredible. Uh, that you experienced all that and you were able to get out of it uh, okay. I mean, I know that you had a you know, concussion. Mental health but, that yeah. I actually learned. I learned the mental health part of it was tough, right? So of after, after you come off that adrenaline, you get out of the hospital, then you go. Is through. there survival guilt? Yeah, there was because Kenneth Fitzgerald uh, had took a. I took a job working for them before a little bit before nine eleven. I backed out last minute. Now, if you know Kenneth Fitzgerald's story, bond broker, they lost yeah. everybody in the World Trade Center. I'm still right. very close. You know the charity work I do mm -hmm. with Kenneth Fitzgerald and Relief Fund is probably attributed to my survivor guilt. They were good enough to get me into a support group after 9-11, knowing how close I was. And I probably had more guilt over not taking that job uh, because the, obviously other folks there, anybody who was there at Kenneth Fitzgerald, um, I was wiped out. 
wiped out. They were wiped out. And you think of all the firefighters and the police officers. I think it's close to 4,000 people that have lost their lives. And there are people, yep. first responders that have Still lost their lives with their lung, lives. Yep. lung issues. I don't understand, uh, you know, again, we go politics, but people in Washington that aren't voting to help some of these people and yep. getting them the help. I was with John Stewart and a couple yeah. of those rallies in DC. Yeah. I was one of the first people. He's very who, passionate about this. issue. Oh, John yeah. is great. You know, he was one of the first people. Well, I was one of the first people, Carolyn Maloney and Chris, uh, I'm going to say that rally to get more for the 9-11 fund to help yeah. rescue workers because I suffered from reactive airways dysfunction syndrome. I remember when I was in that courtyard, yeah. I took in that uh, that pulverized concrete and dust. So let's let's fast Old forward guys. now yeah. to October 1 yeah. shooting here in Las Vegas, which was the uh, worst mass shooting in the history of this yep. country. How on earth are you anywhere near this shooting? How does that happen? That was a cra crazier story of fate. Is I was at Cal Ripken's uh, golf outing a mm -hmm. few days earlier. Um, Brett Raymer, mm -hmm. our friend, mutual sure. friend, yep. tanked, tells me he's doing a show. He's getting engaged on the show. And, hey, come out. And I want to get on TV. My kid's watching the tank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these episodes, you know, Johnny Damon's our mutual friend. I wasn't in that episode. Chris Jericho, I didn't make that episode. Right. Like, I got to be on tanked, you know, like this is my time to be on TV. So I'm like, I'm going to go from Ripken's outing and I'm getting on a plane. I'm going to Vegas and I got Scott Bayo, Chachi's golf oh boy, outing. Chachi. Today. Chachi blocked me on social media, <laughs> oh, by the way. Come yeah. on. I love Scott. Scott's yeah, my did. boy, but it's all good. <laughs> but uh, we had his outing on Monday the 2nd, which actually, ironically, was the day that Tom Petty passed away, which is I remember mm -hmm. being on the golf course the next day. This was like, right. uh, but back to how I ended up there. And it was mm -hmm. a crazy, we do the episode, which, just so you know, I only got on like five seconds. So i um, <laughs> still angry at Brett's producers for leaving me on the cutting room floor after I was lost. You know, I could have been in the middle of the shooting now. Right. For the record, I don't like country music. Neither uh, do I. I'm a Springsteen guy, you mm -hmm. know, I love uh, rock, you know. I'm, mm -hmm. um, so I knew nothing about a Route 91 concert. It just happened to be Sunday um, evening, a friend of mine who I grew up with in Brooklyn said, Hey, let's meet at the hotel in Mandalay Bay for a drink. Uh, we met at the eye candy bar, mm -hmm. uh, which I was at last night, actually, um, reliving that memory. Right. So, um, it was, and I had said, I had to go to bed early. I got a 8 AM flight to Los Angeles. I got to get to Scott. So, you know, a couple drinks sit 10 o'clock and he's staying at Excalibur. Um, and we have a drink about 10 o'clock and he has to get to the tram. I don't know where that tram is. I still don't know where the tram is. I was telling you, I don't even know where right. the Mandalay Bay Excalibur tram is. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I don't know. I don't know where this tram thing is, but I walk outside and just, you'll walk. It's like a good, what a block, big, long block. Yep. You'll get there. So we walk out, we're by the fountains. What do I hear? Pop, pop, pop. Now I remember then uh, about hours earlier, they had an exit. So you're on Las Vegas Boulevard yeah. at that well, time. Well, we're walking toward there. We're by, yeah. we're not actually. And you actually hear the gunshots on we October hear 1. pop, pop, pop. It was like, and it was fireworks is our first reaction. And right, I'm thinking, well, they had the A lot hockey. of people thought that. They had yeah. the Vegas Golden Knights. They had the preseason the game, game I was, that day. I was at that game. That's okay. why I wasn't at the shooting. I was at the preseason Vegas right. Golden Knights so game. I thought it was something to do with that. I'm thinking, wow, that's, you know, yeah. fireworks. Not too far away. Right. Yeah. But here's the part that I always remember in my own memory and so i told the police officers later at night is the next round it, it was louder like right over faster. right over mm -hmm. my head almost oh like it God. was um so he did switch windows we know the story right. of, so i'm believing the first round one window and then he went to the other Correct. window yep. yeah that's probably the timeline is those, those so when you see this happening in real time in the first moment that you you, you realize oh boy this is bad this is an attack and people are going to die no, I, no, boy, you remember, I didn't know that because I didn't know there was a concert across the street. We didn't, I right. didn't know anything about Route 91 or. But I would imagine music. you knew something wasn't something right. Are you was, thinking yeah. about 9 11? Like, well, is that... no, not till later because I heard what I heard somebody say outside was sniper. Something in a sniper is just firing mm -hmm. away at something, but I don't know where the shots are coming from. I didn't even right. know it was above me. I didn't know if it was coming toward us or. So we go back into Mandalay Bay, and this is the part that is the. It's almost like business as usual gambling nobody it was almost like what's going on nobody yeah. knew what was going on it was right, uh, right. i'm telling a security guy do you know something's going on out there and it looked like they looked at me like shrug your shoulders and that part i remember it was about a minute or two later that's when everything hell broke loose um we're being told uh, to get and i we ended up my friend and i in house of blues one of my favorite restaurants. They didn't feed yeah. us, by the way. I was in lockdown. That place, I uh, didn't So they get put it. the whole casino in lockdown, yeah. basically. Yeah. 
SWAT teams coming through there. This is, but it was a delayed wow. reaction. It wasn't really till like a half hour, 45 minutes later. And then my phone is blowing up. I start getting the news is a mass terrorist. Uh, they go into all the casinos shooting people. You Which know, wasn't everybody, true. Yeah. That's where social so media is. So you hear yeah. the bullets outside as you're walking towards Mandalay Bay. So you're actually walking towards By Mandalay Bay. Yeah. And you're walking underneath the room, basically, yes. where the shooting is happening, where the gunshots are being fired. You, you you know something is up and something's not right and something yeah. very bad is happening. You tell a security guard and the security guard kind of shrugs your shoulders. Yeah. He has no idea what's going on. This was, listen, I, obviously the number one to blame is the person who pulled the trigger. There's no Correct. question about that. You know, we know one officer froze for eight or nine minutes. We know that whole thing at one officer, 19, like what took place in Texas. Oh, wow. This was a failure. The response was too slow by yep. Metro police. There's no question about that. Mm. Am I going to call these police officers cowards? No, there was one coward though. Yeah. And you know, I'm like you, I'm, I'm pro police. I'm also pro black lives matter. Yeah. You know, there are great cops and there are great people, tens of millions of people within the black lives matter movement that did not commit any violent crimes. They just want equality. Yep. Cops, most of them are heroes. I go up to them every day. When I see a police officer on the street or in a restaurant, I shake their hand. Thank yep. you for what you do. And I see how much they appreciate it. Because I know right. most of them are very good at what they do. Yep. There were some failures with Metro Police that day. Yeah, and the hours and days after with not getting the pertinent information that I think everybody wanted. Oh, yeah. I understand it's an investigation. So, wow. So you're in lockdown. I have to ask you this question, man. And I'm sure you've been asked this question a million <laughs> times before. You're engulfed in what was the worst terrorist attack in the history of this country. Right. And you are right there engulfed in, in, in what was the worst mass shooting in the history of this right. country. My question is, how? <laughs> how is that even possible? You yeah. don't live here. Yeah. You're here that day. Yeah. I understand the New York thing. You, you did that all, every day, right, yeah. on a daily basis. That makes a little more sense to me. But here you are now across the country in what is the, the biggest mass shooting in the history of this country. I, I must mean, travel too much. You know, the other thing that'll probably freak out your listeners is that now I wasn't in the Boston Marathon the day of the bombing, but the next day we had the risk management. I do risk management for a living, my day job. Right. We had an RMA risk management association. It was called G Corps, a conference in Cambridge. Okay. So it was April 16th to 19th. So I ended up in Cambridge the day the day after, after the bombing, the Boston right? bombing. So, so Sarnayev, not, Sarnayev was still the, the younger one, was because uh, his brother was was killed. Right. Thank God. But uh, the younger one, they were still looking for him when you were there. Yeah. Right. So they were in Memorial Drive. That's the hotel oh I was my at. Gosh. I was at that highest. That is uh, insane. Now I didn't know until I watched the Mark Wahlberg movie about the great car, movie by the, the car, way. the carjacking. You know, right. no Mark. I I watched the movie. I'm thinking that carjacking that occurred there. Well, that next day I had to get to the airport. I had to go to Logan Airport the next day to fly to Oklahoma. So you were there when that whole carjacking with well, the, I, I went, I, I got gas. The Asian student yeah. uh, escaped. So you were I there was, like hours before or after. Correct. Hours before that happened. <laughs> yeah. That is insanity. That man. was the part of it that um, it took. That was a delayed yeah. um, reaction, not not knowing till years later that sure. I was there because I always knew I wasn't there for the bombing. And, and, but, but wasn't the, that wasn't uh, you know wasn't that Mike an example of how we all backed police and. And we were all together, uh, certainly what took place in Boston when you had, I remember it was very emotional. Um, when I watch it, it's emotional. When I see after they had just captured Sonai of the younger right. brother, right? Great right. police work, great police work. And they're take they take him into custody. He goes into an ambulance and all the police cars are leaving the area, or at least some of them are. And you, you remember the scene where everybody's giving them kind of like a round of applause. Yes. I mean, when was the last time we saw something like that? Right. A bunch of police officers, just a very emotional moment that, yep. you know, our police officers, you know, they, they do a wonderful job. There are some yep. bad ones out there and I want them to the officer Chauvin's. There's not many of them, but there are yep. some bad ones out there. I just feel like we're so divided now yep. in so many different ways, but what you have done over the course of your career since nine 11, You've done so many wonderful things with your philanthropy work and just charitable work in saving lives and helping people, police officers, firefighters. Yep. I mean, can you just go into that a little bit? I mean, the work you've done over the years and, and, and the amazing work you've done in, in, in just helping people. I think being a former athlete, you know, you get that competitiveness and that resolve. And when I was knocked down, you get back up again. That's the Rocky mm -hmm. story, right? So after 9-11, after the month of mental health, problem survivor mm -hmm. guilt i got immersed in helping 9 11 families and survivors Kenneth fitzgerald i needed to help and do something mm -hmm. couldn't just sit uh and do nothing so that's how i started really with uh the Kenneth fitzgerald relief fund and doing a lot of stuff to help other 
I have a WTC United Family Group that turned into September 11 Education Trust and helping yep. teach education about 9-11 in classrooms. So that was the activism and also helping build a proper memorial at the World Trade Center. So I got to learn politics uniquely from going through 9-11. I was on both sides. You were a big part of that. Wow, that's incredible. Well, I was in the middle of I've always lot. wanted to go there and see that, by the way. My right. family lives in Connecticut. I've always wanted to see that 9-11 museum. Oh, the museum is a tribute yeah. to the folks that really work behind the scenes to make mm -hmm. that. I mean, they wanted to- One day I want to go there and see They that, wanted yeah. to turn that nothing for the families and survivors. They wanted to put mass transportation right through it. Are they you to serious? Rebuild. Yeah. We Wasn't there a mosque that they were trying to build around there too? Yeah, we I mean, did. come on, man. Listen. I am not, there are so many wonderful Muslim people out there. I am not one of those idiots that looks at a Muslim and, and, and assume like, like the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world or Lauren Barber. Oh, that must be a terrorist. That's racism. I would, I am not that person. We were obviously right. Yeah. We were talking about Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, which has nothing to do with being a Muslim zero. Right. At the same time, if you're one of those good Muslim people, can you understand the sensitivity mm -hmm. of having a mosque? A block away from yeah. where four thousand people died. Let's let's let's, let's just be. I, I didn't like that. Yeah. And I don't think it's racist to say I didn't like that. I don't want a mosque there. Yeah. Where four thousand people died. I'm not blaming you for what happened, but let's have a little bit of sensitivity. You know what I I would compare that to? I don't know. Let's just say there was a bombing in Iran, right? Yeah. Uh, no matter whose fault it is. Let's say the Israelis bombed a, a site in Iran. Would you want a synagogue right there where the bombing right. site was? I didn't like that, and I know a lot of New Yorkers. Didn't like well, that the other either. thing you got, I, mean, I will not get political. I'm not, yeah. right, I'm not going to get political on the show, but Saudi Arabia, who financed 9 11. Right. They didn't do it just on their own. The hijackers had it. Of help. course. We know where they got that support from. It's of been course. traced. And I'm a part of yep. a class action suit um, through the U.S. Victim Sponsor State Terrorism Fund. And uh, yeah. they're starting to pay distributions uh, based on, but we got mm -hmm. seized money from terrorist organizations that are used. And that's really where that horrendous. So yeah. So the live golf tour, you know, we can yeah. go on and on about, we can talk about that, but do yeah. you, I think you're aware of this Muhammad Atta and three of his terrorist bastards that were behind nine 11, mm -hmm. they spent uh, a couple days here in Las Vegas. I didn't know that. Okay. They did. Wow. Uh, they rented a car. There's 40 or 50 miles that are not accounted for. Mm -hmm. FBI doesn't know where they went. We know they went to a strip club. Yeah. They know they were staying a, at a kind of like a raunchy, cheap motel on the strip. Yeah. And we know they spent one night at a strip club. Mm -hmm. But there's 50 miles. Or, uh, there might be more, maybe 60 miles on the car that they rented. And nobody knows where they wow. went. But yes, they knew they were going to die. Uh, they knew that their families would be getting a lot of money from yep. from you know the bin laden family or as yep. you mentioned Saudi, the saudis and, yep. right and i believe they were just planning out their last few days and just having fun yep. that's what i believe they were doing they knew they were going to die and they were just spending money having a good time yep. uh, i don't think there's anything uh what do you make of the conspiracy theorists out there oh, there's so many of them out so there disgusting you like know, starting yeah. starting today right we can right. talk and we don't have to get into yeah. this but talking about the conspiracy theorists like COVID. You know, the COVID yeah. conspiracy theorists and then the conspiracy theorists about Trump won the election and all this other nonsense. But the 9-11 conspiracy theorists that say it was an inside oh, job. Yeah, that was uh, who's who's the former wrestler? Uh, Jesse, Jesse Ventura. Ventura. I, I mean, love him as a wrestler, but I mean, as a, he's a nut. Yeah. yeah I mean, listen, does the government lie to us? Absolutely. Yeah. Are they always truthful with the American people? Absolutely yeah. not. But to, to come to think that George W. Bush, and by the way, I am not, I've never been a George W. Bush fan. Mm -hmm. I have never once said that it was an inside job. Yeah. Now, the war in Iraq, very different. Right. Uh, that that should have never happened. But I'm talking about the events of 9-11. To say that Condoleezza Rice and George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and the FBI and the government were behind it well, like Vegas, is so they idiotic. The biggest shooting was an inside yes, job. I there, was there, yeah. I witnessed both, and they were not inside jobs. It's but, ridiculous. Yeah. Insulting to the victims. Uh, yes. Sandy Hook. Look, I mean, how horrific that Alex was. Jones. Yeah. yeah, that didn't happen. Right. right? I mean, yep. this nonsense has to stop. I want to hear more from people like you, mm. people like you who, who help people who who save lives, who help those who risk their lives for this country. You know, the good cops, the firefighters. How about all those firefighters? You and cops Fred that Greenberg died. on your show. Fred's a good friend. Fred's of mine. a fantastic Parkland man. Yeah. I mean, the impact I was looking at post he just made the other day. Look at all that at four years, what he's done. And he's Fred Gutenberg is a hero. Yes, he is. Um, he lost his daughter in Parkland. He's done my show a number of times. He's a wonderful man. 
and we need more people like him. You yep. shouldn't have had to have lost your daughter or son yep. to do what Fred is doing. Yep. We need more people like you. You shouldn't have had to add a concussion and almost lost your life on 9-11 to help the good men and women in uniform right. and police officers, firefighters. I'm glad we have people like you, but it shouldn't have to take that for people to get involved. Yep. You know, it's like what I say all the time with politicians, you know, until it happens to you. Yep. You know, we talk about gun control issues on this yep. show a lot and all these other issues. Until it happens to you, you know, until one of these far righties, God forbid, I don't want yep. it to happen, but have a family member die of gun violence, yep. then maybe you'll do something about it. Yep. And it's just like, I'm, I just, I'm, I'm really upset at where we are as a nation. I love New York. Yep. Okay. I grew up in Connecticut. I have family members on East 65th between first and second. Right. I love that city. And you know why I love the people in that city? Because they're in your face. This is who I am. Yep. If you don't like it, go F yourself, but this exactly. is who I am. And listen, most of my friends are from the East Coast. Yeah. I feel like the West Coast mentality is phony. Yeah. You know, do you agree with me? Because you're a New Yorker. Yeah. Yeah. I love the people back yep. East. I love the New York people. We're authentic. Yeah. That's what we are. Right. Yeah. I love so, it. I love it. We are it. who we are. Yeah. You know? Well, here's well, here's what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk. Uh, we're talking with Mike Dempsey, by the way, if you're just joining us. Uh, multi-sport athlete, played college football, philanthropist. We're talking about all the things he does to, to help people since 9-11, really. Uh, he was in the towers just moments before those towers uh, collapsed. Uh, and he was right there on October one. He just gave that story as well. He, he works, uh, he's a risk management speaker as well. And a great family man. Uh, talk to him a little bit more about that when we come back. But I also want to talk to Mike a little bit about an upcoming boxing match that he has. Uh, Mike Tyson has put his name on that. And uh, Mike is going to be Mike Dempsey is going to be fighting on that undercard. So I'm going to talk to him a little bit about his, his athletic career. Oh yeah. He also had an at-bat as a New York Yankee, so we're going to talk a little bit about that also. It's yep. a wild and crazy story, oh, yeah. folks. And by the way, uh, if you want to give us a call, you can, 702-221-7283. Again, that number, 221-7283. I want to tell you guys real quickly before we go to break about my friends, Brian Slopak at Jackson's Bar and Grill, located at Flamingo and Jones. You walk in there, you mention my name, and you mention the name of this show. Sign up for a player's card. You get $10 free slot play. Their promotion this month, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, you get 500 points. You get $50 free slot play. Great. Great bar, great atmosphere, great food. I know you're going to love it. Jackson's Bar and Grill. Tell them I sent you. Located at Flamingo and Jones. Uh, we'll be right back with Mike Dempsey right after this. We'll take a quick break. You're listening to Pushing the Limits right here on KSHP. Hey, everybody. Are you struggling to find a pizza place that reminds you of Brooklyn? That true blue New York style pie? Well, worry no more. Stallone's Italian Eatery Pizza is a knockout. We're located at 467 East Silverado Ranch Boulevard. Just off of Premier Road, half a mile east of South Point Casino, just minutes from the Las Vegas Strip. Come by and grab a slice of pie. Plus, check out our Brooklyn-inspired Italian cuisine. Our sandwiches are super hero, that is, because why be a sub when you can be a hero? Stallone's Italian Eatery is here to serve you phenomenal food, Vegas. Forget about it. Look, it's impossible for the average person to find a great attorney out there. There's so much misinformation. Now, let me introduce you to former Chief Deputy District Attorney Thomas Moskal. He was Las Vegas' top DUI prosecutor for years. He prosecuted the most high-profile DUI cases in Clark County. No one knows more about DUI law in Nevada. Just Google it. If you get charged with DUI, whether it's a misdemeanor or even more importantly, a felony, you need Thomas Moskal representing you. His relationships with the prosecutors and judges and his knowledge of DUI law to work for you. So give him a call now or text him at 702-848-5555. It's your life and liberty that's at stake. Don't wait. Call now. That number again, 702-848-5555. Shopping is always easy with the Radio Shopping Show. Whether it's shopping during any one of our live shows right here on AM 1400 or listening live on the KSHP app, you can always call in at 702-221-7283 to pick up great deals with your favorite host. Or shop 24-7 at KSHP.com. Go to KSHP.com and select Shopper's Guide to browse hundreds of businesses featured on the show. Place your order online and we'll have it shipped right to your front door. With so many possibilities, it's hard not to shop. Do you want to be part of one of the fastest growing shows in the Valley? Well, now is your chance. Pushing the Limits covers it all. The only show in town talking news, politics, sports, entertainment, you name it. You can now give your business the push it needs to take it to the next level. We have all sorts of advertising packages that can fit your budget. Give us a call at 725-256-9809 or send us an email at 
ptlvegasales at gmail.com and be part of the fastest growing show in Las Vegas. As a three-time international award-winning restaurant, Joe's New York Pizza uses only the freshest and best available ingredients. From giant slices of hand-tossed pie to calzones, strombolis, fingers, and wings, Joe's serves all your favorites. Stop in for a slice at one of their two Las Vegas locations at Paradise and Harmon or South Las Vegas Boulevard, or you can check out their menu at joesnewyorkpizzalv.com. Hey everybody, it's Brian Shapiro from Pushing the Limits. I want to tell you guys about Sahara West Urgent Care and Wellness. They're conveniently located on the southwest corner of Sahara and Jones. They're open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. At Sahara West Urgent Care, they'll take care of all your health care needs. They offer routine services such as physicals, STD testing, car accident treatment and work injuries. You name it, they do it. They have on-site x-ray, EKG, ultrasound, and labs. They treat chronic conditions such as asthma, blood pressure, diabetes, and more. They also offer general wellness exams and treatments such as testosterone enhancement and cancer screening. They're located on Sahara 6125 West Sahara Avenue. Their number is 702-248-0554. And the best part, they accept most major insurances and affordable cash pay prices. Office visits starting at just $95. And I'm also a client. So please give them a call, 702-248-0554. Hey, everybody. Are you struggling to find a pizza place that reminds you of Brooklyn? That true blue New York style pie? Well, worry no more. Stallone's Italian Eatery Pizza is a knockout. We're located at 467 East Silverado Ranch Boulevard, just off of Premier Road, half a mile east of South Point Casino, just minutes from the Las Vegas Strip. Come by and grab a slice of pie. Plus, check out our Brooklyn-inspired Italian cuisine. Our sandwiches are super hero, that is, because why be a sub? And you can be a hero. Stallone's Italian Eatery is here to serve you phenomenal food, Vegas. Forget about it. All right, welcome back. It is Pushing the Limits. On a Friday, joined in studio by Mike Dempsey, a multi-sport athlete, philanthropist, definitely a terrorism survivor. He escaped uh, the Twin Towers on 9-11, and he was there at Mandalay Bay on October 1. Just crazy stuff. But the things he's done in his life, the stories he has, are it's just incredible. I was reminiscing a little bit about some of my favorite stories of being in Las Vegas 20 years. Nothing like some of the stuff that he's done. Crazy. So, Mike, let's have a little fun here. You know, it was a story that you had told me for the first time the other day over at Brett's Restaurant, Stallone's. And I want you to tell our listeners, because it is so crazy. I mean, you grew up, of course, a big Yankees fan, right? Right. So you're in the Yankees dugout. Tell me how this comes about, where you actually get a major league at bat. This is such a crazy story. Well, what happened is Hank Steinbrenner, um, Georgia's son. You know, I've done volunteer work, mm-hmm. uh, helped out Rainer Grown, bat boy for the Yankees, who's been around the organization for 50 years. And I was always part of helping with uh, charity events mm-hmm. and causes uh, for Mrs. Steinbrenner. And over the years, I met all the Yankee greats, uh, you know, from all the 70s, Gator, uh, Reggie, all the guys over the years. And it's been like a privilege being around. I've done a couple of those Yankee camps. What's Steinbrenner's son like? Hank was great. Hank was yeah. into the horse racing. He didn't really yeah. like the baseball. Hal's into the baseball. Hank loved the races, yeah. horse races in Ocala. So and you he, met him because of all your philanthropy work and, and yeah. the stuff you've done in New York. Well, yeah. he had an organization called Hank's Yanks. Uh, yep. They serve underprivileged kids in yep. the Bronx and Connecticut. And I started helping them. I helped actually uh, coordinate their golf outing a couple of years ago. So I did a lot with, uh, but yeah. back in 2015, we had the uh, Brian Doyle. Uh, he mm-hmm. was a Yankee World Series legend in 1978. Yep. Willie Randolph is injured. Brian steps in and has this amazing World Series. He should have been the MVP. Bat at 438. And uh, Brian comes down with Parkinson's disease, mm-hmm. which Kirk Gibson, a lot of other guys, you know, devastating disease. And uh, we decided to turn the old Timers Day weekend, which I go to every year. I love being around the old Yankee greats, and we decided to do a, a, a game in Scranton, PA, the AAA uh, facility for, and have all the same old timers 
go up to and they're going to play two days in a row, right? right. Yankee Stadium on Saturday, mm-hmm. Sunday we're going to play a Legends game, Old Timers Day, and I just figured I was going to go there support Brian, get on the field before the game, right? Um, but I said let me bring my old Yankee jersey, you know, <laughs> just in case they need a pinch runner. That's all I was looking to do was pinch run. How about the old guys like Chris Chambliss and a lot of those guys, Roy White. And as I get to the stadium that day, and it it was a horrendous. Uh, we had a bus that took us there. Mm. Uh, my family got there. My girls who hate baseball, but <laughs> they said this is. And it was Father's Day. That's right. the best part yeah. about it. I guess I best Father's Day of my life. It was 2015 Father's Day, and we're playing a game. Now I just thought I was gonna be there as a spectator with my right, family. Got VIP. That's a normal, right? Right. Just be get, happy you have the VIP access. Get to the stadium, yeah. and I you get put hand, you got your jersey on. They handed me a jersey, <laughs> and, they, and I go in the locker room, and I'm and who am I with? I got Mickey Rivers on my left. I got Reggie Jackson on oh my, my right. God. Uh, I'm a Yankee player for this is the real deal. This isn't fantasy. This is the real deal, right? Um, all the Yankee legends, Don Larson's two lockers down. Who threw a perfect game? <laughs> That's crazy. Bobby Richardson. You have yep. every era represented. And, you know, I didn't have time to get nervous because, you know, it was pregame. I get on the field. I'm throwing the ball around. I'm warming up with Jesse Barfield. Just amazing stuff being on that. Um, and everybody's yeah. looking, saying, who's number 24? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not Tino Martinez, but I could pull, you know. And Tino's a good friend of mine, by the way. But I wore his, I did represent his Catcher, number proudly. Right? No, Tino was the first baseman. First he baseman. Okay. Shows you Magler. how much I know. Okay. But it's all good. But I think I'm thinking of Jorge Posada. That's Jorge what I'm Posada, looking at. Yeah. <laughs> but Tino, great guy. But I went number 24. Yep. And um, so I just figured I was going to maybe be a pinch runner. They do the yep. introductions. First inning, Mickey Rivers, love Mick the Quick. Gets on base, calls me from the pinch run form. I pinch ran from Mick the Quick. I score. I'm done. I'm in my first inning. Okay. I don't have to do another thing. So third, no, second inning. Gene Stick Michael, who was a player, coach, manager, general yeah. manager, legend. He's about 75 years old, 74 at the time. Yep. And I guess he was looking at uh, who he was going to face in the game. It was a guy named Jeff Nelson, four-time mm-hmm. World Series champ. Yes. Jeff is six foot eight, looks like seven feet on the mound. Remember the mound? Randy Johnson esque. Yeah. yeah. Side armor. He can't even see the ball. Yeah. And he is competitive. <laughs> He's not a guy that lobs it over the plate. Let me tell you. Right. So Stick looks at me, he says, Mike, grab it back. <laughs> Now, the one thing in the footage you got to watch, I'm going to send you a clip later, is that I didn't, when he says grab a bat, do you need to be wearing a diaper at that yeah, point? Or uh, that's like, that's well, like, are you serious? Did you think he was joking? I thought he was joking, but then I look at the bat rack and there's two, <laughs> there's three bats there. One of them was Mickey Rivers' bat, too small for me. And there was Reggie's yep. bat. It's a Reggie's bat. Reggie, Reggie Jackson's me, bat. Yeah, he used Reggie Jackson's bat. And he gave me a dirty look. Reggie was not happy. I used Reggie because I had to grab a bat, but I missed the helmet. You had to grab a bat. You grab Reggie Jackson's bat. And he gives you a dirty look in the dirty dugout. Look, but the funny thing is I forgot to get my helmet. So I actually go up to home plate and, and I watch this you footage. You see me. Helmet. I'm not wearing a helmet. And nobody said anything. That was the best part about the whole thing. Was, <laughs> so I'm in there and I'm like, and I look and I didn't know who's pitching. I thought it was Kamenicki. I thought, oh, I could hit Kamenicki. Yeah. I'm looking at Nelson. I'm like, oh, no. And the first one, I foul off into the dugout. Which and is I have a good, a great. That's, yeah, you, you got a piece of it. I got yeah. a piece of it. Got You're already scrambles. better off than most pitchers in Major League yeah. Baseball. <laughs> right. And then the second pitch, I get into the uh, right field foul. Uh, but I, I had You're two, making – but I you're an contact. athlete. You're an athlete. You played college sports. Right. You obviously have – but even, even with that, though, to be able to – you're not warmed up. No. You know, you, came you're just cold. up there <laughs> yeah. I mean, facing a guy that's throwing how hard. Um, I mean, he was in prone 70. You know, yeah. Jeff, so nothing crazy. Jeff told me yeah. after the game, he says, Mike, I, I said, why are you throwing so fast? He goes, well, I don't <laughs> know. If I throw it slow, I can't hit right. the plate. Right. So I didn't do it to because I said, so you, man, you were throwing. So you make contact on the first two pitches. Right, yeah. yeah. Then I get it to a 2-2 count. I took a couple of outside. You have to have a good eye. You know, two yeah, strikes, you're pressing. Then he threw one right down the middle below. And I like to hit low in the zone there. And <laughs> when I hit it, honestly, Brian, I thought it was gone because I hit all, I got all of it. It was just a center but field base hit. It was center field base hit, but it was a good hit. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a cheap and hit. And you've got video of it. I got you video of it. It was on, it was televised. It was like one That's of those so cool. cool. And I scored, I played eight. You eight. ran the bases. You, you, it was a single, right? Yeah. You get to second base yeah. and a couple more hits and you're able to I'm score, able to score again. And I, and it, yeah. <laughs> And I played seven that's innings. So I cool. played seven innings in right field, uh, that's which so, is great too. And I played so cool. deep. So yeah. I didn't want anything hit over my head. So Reggie Jackson, a jerk? No, 
He was now, a Reggie nice guy. Reggie yeah. can come off, um, if you don't know him, Reggie has a heart of gold. He does his, yeah. uh, he has a Mr. October Foundation. I've done a lot of work he with does him over the years. I've heard Derek Jeter and A-Rod are kind of jerks. They're not the nicest people in the world. Derek, uh, I, I've did a lot with turn to with his foundation over the years. You know, I think uh, it depends. Some guys, I'm not going to, you know. Paul O'Neill. I've, I've, the Paul's one guy. That, guy. Yeah. Really? I, yeah. I, I yeah. hear things about Paul O'Neill that he wasn't the greatest guy to play with and he wasn't the most personable guy and he was kind of a jerk. Yeah, so is that not true? Because you know all these guys. Well, you know, I also do. I'm on a product called True Niagen with Paul O'Neill. I uh, I use it every day. I'm an ambassador. Like He's Paul just intense. Paul's intense. Under, misunderstood. One of great broadcasters. Yeah. I think like David Cohn. David Cohn is a unique guy. What do you think guy. of Sterling speaking of broadcasters? What yeah. do you, I, I just, I'm tired <laughs> of his shtick. Yeah, I'm ref I'll refrain The from judge <laughs> is in session. The judge. It's like, shut up already. It's old already. I Come up, on. I grew up Phil Rizzuto. <laughs> I grew up with Frank Messer, Bill White. Those are my guys. So That's you don't like group. the, uh, that uh, boy is high. It is far. It is gone. Like, it's like, it's like, come to, on, I man. I the commentary, honestly. It's, it's terrible. Not, I'm a, Who's I'm the female that, that, does the, the the games with him? Suzanne Wall. What do you think about her? I'm, I'm going to refrain from saying. <laughs> okay. I just leave it. Fair there. enough. Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah. I was anything. I'll get sued. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but no, I mean that whole Yankee experience was. And remember, I did a lot of Yankee tournaments. We represented. We played mm -hmm. against other teams for charity. I did a how, lot of that stuff. How and crappy was it though that? Um, I thought the Yankees for sure were going to beat Arizona after 9/11. Yeah. I said to myself, you know. Uh, this is it. They're going to win this World Series for all in memory yep. of all the 9/11 victims. Yep. And listen, uh, the Diamondbacks deserve to win, right? Yeah. I mean, that was a great team, but that yeah. sucked. Yeah, Luis Gonzalez. That sucked. Had, oh, I mean, Luis Gonzalez say... screwed the Yankees. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he had so many big hits in that series. But it was a great. Craig uh, Council series. too, right? Council yeah. was on that team. That was a really good team. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Randy Johnson, right? Am I? Yeah. Johnson, yeah. That was a great team. But I thought just I if there was any time I thought the Yankees were going to win a World know. Series, it was that year. That should have been. That, that was year. heartbreaking. It was. <laughs> I remember I was driving from Atlantic City back to Connecticut, and I was listening to to the, the final game, and I was saying to my buddy as we were driving back, I was like, uh, the Yankees are going to win this game. I, mean, I didn't bet on it. I wasn't a degenerate it was as good, I was you know, now. It was a good but version <laughs> for the city, we needed yeah. that in yeah. New York City. You know, we were all in shock. You know, nine sure, eleven sure. still. And that brought the city back, I yeah. think. You know, Joe mm -hmm. Torrey, and I have a lot of history with Joe Torrey. Don Zimmer, did you know Zim? I know Zim, too. What was he yeah, like? He was great. Uh, Zim was he's a, a legend. Yeah, he's a legend. He's and, a legend, uh, right? I got to know all these guys, and, like, you know, the older guys, and it's funny, the, the next generation. So I'm very close with the Billy Martin Jr., uh, Todd Mercer, Bobby's son. Uh, they passed uh, David Mantle, Mickey, mm -hmm. the son of the Mick. So can I ask you this? Because your your history of New York City and all these people, you know, what the hell is going on with the Knicks? Yeah. What is... The owner there, <laughs> Dolan, is such a jerk. Do you, you know, know that guy? I've never met him, but Charles Oakley is a good friend of mine. I love Oak. Charles I just saw him. I just <laughs> yeah. saw him a few months ago at the Cigar yeah. Bar at Resorts World. We were talking, and I said, yeah. I'm so sorry what they did to you. Because yeah. he's such a personable guy, Oakley. Yeah. such a, And a legend. One of the best rebounders in the history of the game. Yeah. What the hell is going on with that franchise? The Knicks. The franchise. You know, like a lot of the old guys, like Walt Clyde Fraser. I do a lot of charity oh, great guy. all these guys. Yeah. Pearl Monroe. All wonderful uh, people. Yeah, John Starks. Yeah. I love. Love I mean, John Starks. I've been around these guys. Yeah. for years but the neck that right now it's hard to what is connect. Dolan doing i think that's just yeah. an example of an owner who just his he lets his ego get yep. in the way now listen the cowboys are maybe but again jerry jones i like jerry jones mm. but i feel like here's another guy who just refuses to step out of the way yep. and wants to make all the decisions let some football people make decisions i feel like dolan but see steinbrenner was different george steinbrenner people uh, you know said he was a villain George was most first of the most philanthropic guy in Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. He did so much for the for that for yeah. the city. Yeah. Number two, Billy Martin was always with the organization. He might have been fired five times. He yeah. never lost his job. Yeah. He always was on payroll. He was always part of the organization. I'm close with Jill Martin. Sure. Billy's yep. very misunderstood. One of the best managers in the history of the game. But George was all for the Yankees and he put all that support into you it. You cannot criticize you the cannot. late George Steinbrenner and Absolutely what he was able not. to accomplish and all the, the, the wins that they had and, and the money that he made for the franchise yep. and the philanthropy philanthropy work being around him and he loved yeah, wrestling because yeah. you know i yeah. tried out for professional wrestling four days in wc did you really i didn't know that power plan 1995 <laughs> give after, me your wrestling voice oh uh, i can't you know i would have been a great <laughs> I, I love roddy piper so i'd have been hot a good, rod hot rod and i got to know roddy piper i love you know, roddy piper told, told, is he still he died didn't he, he passed away i was in vegas you, you know seven died? years ago when i got the news and i had All just these been guys, they did a lot of steroids right now, roddy did not roddy was really? actually just had uh remember they did the autopsy roddy was pretty clean i know he had maybe some limited the ultimate Warrior not, yeah. and Macho Man passed away. And Roddy, well, Roddy, the Ultimate Roddy Warrior still is he still? No, he passed away. Warrior, a while? I saw Warrior before he died Jeez. too. And, uh, he you ever had, meet Andre the Giant? I never met Andre the Giant. I would have loved to have yeah. had a beer with that guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I love wrestling growing up. But I tried out for Power Plant 
And this guy, Dwayne Bruce, he was the head. They called him Sarge. And he put me through four days of back bumps, hitting the ropes, lacerations of my back. Remember, I had two ACL. Yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah. just had the surgery by the yeah. time. And Paul Ondorf, Mr. Wonderful, was one of the trainers. Mr. And I Wonderful. And I, I took, remember that yeah, guy, too. I took, he was one of the trainers. I took a bump. Remember the Bushwhackers? Bushwhackers. <laughs> yeah. They had a thing in Tampa. Still I love those guys. Bushwhacker Luke. I still see it. Tito Santana. Time. Tito was a great guy in New Jersey. I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah sure. Love. Guy. I loved all those guys growing up. I'm not really into wrestling now. Like I was. Goldberg was in my class. Actually. Oh, no. He made it. Goldberg made it, and I yeah. did not. And Dale, Dale Torborg, uh, son of Jeff Torborg, he made it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of guys from that class, I did not make it. Four days, I took a bump. You're supposed to tuck your head when you take a power slam. They didn't tell me that. I'm not a gymnast. You didn't know how to protect and yourself. Well, you've 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 been pretty successful in yeah. in other sports. I bounced uh, back. But you yeah. got a pretty damn good hockey coach out there in New York, and and the Knights were morons for letting him go. That's yeah. Gerard Gallant. What yep. he has done with that New York Rangers uh, yeah. franchise yep. in two years, in a couple of years, yeah. and turning that. I mean, they're Stanley Cup contenders now it's every year. Back. I mean, uh, Gerard Gallant is, is such a phenomenal coach. What do you make of Steve Nash and that whole situation with Kyrie Irving and what happened there with the, oh, with the wow. just ridiculous, so, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I thought the Nets were going to run the table in the next couple of years with yeah. the, what they had, and I thought they were going to really put that dream team together. And, yeah. I, and Steve Nash, I mean, I met him. Kyrie Irving, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Kyrie, and no. you can you can criticize Steve Nash, because and, and it's fair. I don't yeah. think he's done a great job. Kyrie Irving has screwed that franchise. Yes, has. That, that team should not have been playing the Boston Celtics in the first round. That could have been the Eastern Conference Finals. Agreed. And if Kyrie Irving, what do you make of that? As a New Yorker, as a sports fan, yes, we shouldn't be forced to get the vaccine, but he's putting out misinformation. This is Agreed. the same guy who says the earth is flat. Yeah. I mean, how could anybody <laughs> take this idiot yeah. seriously? He's a wonderful basketball player. But – Remember what he did in Boston too. He was yeah. he he hurt the chemistry yeah. of that team. Is he an unbelievable talent? Yes, but I'm not going to say he's a great teammate. And I'm His history I'm says surprised because you know I've done a lot with Coach K, a lot of charity work with him too. And Coach K is a wonderful man, good guy. Yeah, yeah he is. And people you know, in Vegas aren't too fond of him. But I, that's I know. Okay. UNLV days. <laughs> yeah. I know. I get that. But I mean, he's grown. And everybody yep. that goes through his program usually, but Kyrie was one and done. Right? You know, jumped to the NBA, but that's not the Coach K way. You know, he's a team. He teaches a team. Yeah. Um, we do a lot you've, of that. You've done stuff, stuff with Coach K. speaking, he came to 9/11 yeah. to New York. To Did he really? Speak That's with great. Us after 9/11, you know Rick Pitino. Uh, yeah, met Rick Pitino yeah. and I John Cal Perry. Yep, yeah. I know all those guys. But uh, most of these guys are good people. Yeah, right. right. Most of them, they 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 want to. They know that. Yeah, they have their coaching or uh, their athletes, whoever they are. But they also know they have a higher calling. They have yeah. big platforms, and I, and I think. Uh, Tom Izzo is another one that comes to mind. There's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of Jay good. Jay Wright people. was a good friend of mine. Hey, Bill and great coach, guy. Awesome guy. Are you surprised that he just retired? I'm like, yeah. what? That yeah. guy's young. Yeah. Jay Wright was an assistant coach here at UNLV back in the he day before he got the some, Villanova job. I think it'll take a couple years off and come, come back. back. That's my theory. He has yeah. to, right? Yeah. I Legendary so. coach. Yep. Love him. Uh, if you're just joining us again, he is Mike Dempsey. Uh, terrorism survivor, uh, multi-sport athlete, philanthropist. So let's talk a little boxing, guy. shall we? Yep. I love Mike Tyson. I've always loved Mike Tyson. I've uh, always been a big fan of his. I think he's hung out with some bad people over the years. And, of course. And, uh, but uh, I've never seen him as a criminal. That's just me. I never yeah. have. I know he's a convicted criminal, but I've never seen him as though. But uh, he's, he lives out here in Las Vegas. Good father, good husband. He's turned his life around, Absolutely. and I'm happy for him. But a tough life. He's yep. had a tough life. But now you're working with him, and you're going to be in the, so to speak, you're well, in the undercard of his boxing event. You're going to be fighting in his uh, event, uh, which is in New York. Tell me a little bit about Albany, this. Albany, New York, that's where I played college football. Mm -hmm. played briefly for the Albany Firebirds Arena Football. It, it's like a homecoming for me. Mm -hmm. It's homecoming for Mike Tyson. Empire State Convention Center, where we're having the fight, that's where Mike had his first professional fight. I did you not know, know that. Yeah. Mike is Catskills, New York, Customato. Customato, yeah. Rooney, sure. Um, Teddy Atlas, briefly, until Teddy. You know any of those guys? Yeah, I know all those guys. Well, I didn't know Customato. You didn't meet Customato, but, no, but Teddy Kevin, Atlas Kevin is Rooney trained guy. me at Uncle Sam's Boxing Club in right Detroit, yeah. New York. I had my last prof uh, my last amateur fight 30 years ago, 1992. Yeah. Um, you know, and I lost. So I got disqualified. Uh, I guessed myself You haven't out. fought in 30 years. 30 years, no, I have not. So I've you're been, getting back in the ring. Well, I get to where, so 30 years ago, yeah. I gassed myself out. I uh, was disqualified because I spit out my mouthpiece twice, three times in the, <laughs> in the second round. I, so I got booed out of the ring. I was just disgraceful. Now, remember Dempsey, <laughs> Jack Dempsey, you know, I thought sure. they had a lineage there. No relation to Jack Dempsey. They call me Baby Jack. It was a joke. But that's the, so a couple of years ago, we put together, Jerry Cooney is a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, Jerry Cooney, Larry Holmes. Sure. Um, Jerry Cooney had a fight night for and uh, support YCS, uh, a great charity in New Jersey. They supports. So we're gonna do a fight night. Me and Jerry. I'm like, this is my idol. I mean, I'm I'm there. Dempsey Cooney will promote it. We did for two years, and what happened was COVID. 
canceled it. And then Jerry tours rotated cup. And what happened was Jerry could not, he couldn't play golf anymore. He's had some. Mm. So then I was going to get Tim with a spoon. Um, as a replacement didn't work out. I mean, um, and I'm like, what am I going to do? Who's my opponent came across this wonderful guy that I met Dean, the Welsh road warrior Williams, mm -hmm. uh, cruiserweight champion back in 2001. He was in the last Creed movie was in team Drago. Oh, he cool. played that Russian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Dean is a wonderful guy, mm -hmm. British, Irish. I said, we and this is your opponent. Together. It's my opponent. And he's still, he's a year younger than me. I'm 51 next month. And Dean is uh, 50. And but we're good friends, uh, great family man. You're not going to be spitting out your mouthpiece, are you? I hope not. You never know. No, when don't do that. On me. I mean, we're gonna we could turn don't this into that. a grudge match. This is no, fun, though. It, this is this is fun. cool for you. It's fun yeah, exhibition, points. This right? And it's on the Mike, Mike Tyson's put his name on this of, thing. It's gonna yeah. be a lot of fun. Mike Tyson, let me say about Cage Wars. The yeah. irony is that Tim Rankin's uh, college football team of mine in Albany, Great yeah. Dane. Um, Tim was a beast. I mean, one of the best players we ever yeah. had going through the program. He found a Cage Wars in 2007. It started out as uh, 518, that's the area code for Albany, yeah. 518 grappling. So started, they put on 518 shows in about like eight years. Wow. Remember, it was an MMA, it was not legal in New York State till 2016. Mm. 2016, he turns Cage Wars into now. It's got timed up with, teamed up with a guy named Tom Marcelino. He's got yeah. this thing going big, doing 50 shows a year. Um, he's putting on all these events, deleting upstate New York. Um, yeah, it's getting as big as it'll be. I believe it'll be the Dana White, the next Dana White uh, of the future. You know, you have Bellator, you wow. have UFC. Yeah. He's combining. We have a pro boxing. Remember, on Friday night when I do the thing, it's pro boxing. Larry Sales is the headliner, Irish guy. We have Irish team night. So I brought Mickey Ward into this event. Irish Mickey Ward is a good friend of mine. No, I'm through Johnny Damon. Sure. I've been through. So Irish yeah. Mickey and I. We you helped get me Johnny Damon on the show a few yeah. times. Yeah, I know. I appreciate so, that. Well, I'll tell you something. I wish I could watch it in person, but I will be watching it on TV. It will be streamed on I, Stimulus. I will uh, I will be watching it on my laptop. Yep. Um, and, and I look forward to watching the fight. I, I wish you luck, man. Uh, so, but gosh, before we go, we've touched on so many different topics uh, with you, Mike. I want to know how people can get, get involved with your charity work for people that are listening now. What do they do? They, if they want to get involved, they want to help you out. You do so many things to help so many people, not just in New York city, but across the country. So, so much charity work in helping those that need help, uh, that need it. Uh, so how do people get involved? How can people contact you? Yeah. I know, I know you have a great website, yeah. which I went on last night, but how can people contact you and get involved with the things you're doing in the philanthropy work that Obviously you do? Facebook, Instagram's my, I'm not on Twitter, uh, I'm not political, yeah. so I don't get up, but, uh, unfortunately I am <laughs> sports, sports, sports philanthropy. I'm part of a sports philanthropy network, a group that formed a couple of years ago, Roy, uh, Kessel, uh, Caleb Braham. We do a lot of stuff um, involving NFL alumni. You know, I support the NFL alumni charities. I do a lot of stuff with baseball, but NFL is really the philanthropy stuff I do a lot, the most work with, and Giant Damon Foundation. So always looking for people that can help bring something to the table, fundraise. It's hard during COVID. Fundraising was very difficult, but we're trying to turn sports and bring more philanthropy and connect the two. Mm. And I think this boxing match is a great example. We're Absolutely. raising money for Team Mickey Ward Charities. So cool. What it's all about. And yeah. uh, people can write out checks and support what Team Mickey Ward's doing to help out kids and underprivileged yeah. kids in Massachusetts. Watch the movie The Fighter. Mark Wahlberg plays. Yes, it. good movie. Maybe Mark Wahlberg will play me in the next movie. We'll you got to get me Wahlberg on this show, man. Uh, I got to talk entourage. Mark's my guy. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, Mark, <laughs> I, tell, I tease Mark because I know Vinny Papali, Vince Papali from sure. Invincible. And yeah. uh, Mickey Ward, I said, you're missing the best guy you got to play is Mike Dempsey. Tell Mark. <laughs> yeah, you know, they yeah. got to make a movie about you and your life. It's so fascinating. <laughs> but I'll say this. You know, you hear people all the time saying, well, God has, a, you know, uh, things a happen for a reason. Yeah. And, 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 and listen, it's very difficult for me sometimes to talk about all the bad things that happen. To, to good people or for example those kids in texas it's hard to even make a statement like that you can't but in your situation i believe you can yeah. i believe god had a purpose for you i believe and i'm not a very extremely religious spiritual person but i believe there was a reason why you were there on 9 11 on that day. You, the adversity yes is what boxing's all about you, you get knocked yeah. down you get back up again there's the a fight, reason the fight was over four months ago when jerry couldn't fight and i was canceled yeah this thing tim came to me and said mike i'm doing this cage wars with mike tyson right i'm like i love mike i saw him eight years ago i love you part of it can i bring mickey ward now mickey ward's part of it now we're bringing all now together. you're raising all this we're money. money that's so great that well mike like, I, I, it's finally nice to finally meet you in person. Yeah. You've, you've done my show before and, and I know we'll have you on again, probably, you know, when the anniversary of nine 11 comes on, I'd love to have you back on in my but, next sport. Maybe I'll do WrestleMania with the rock next year. You never know. There'll you be never else, know. I mean, yeah, you are just, you are just everywhere. It could be a major league <laughs> baseball at bat. It could be a, a boxing fight. It, this yeah. guy's all over the place, but, but most importantly is the things you do to help.
help people every day. I have so much admiration and respect for you for your philanthropy work and what you do. Keep up the great work, Mike. It's it's a pleasure uh, finally meeting you in person, my man. Have fun here in Vegas tonight. I know you will. And uh, great, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Coming up next, yeah, there was kind of a big Supreme Court decision today. Overturn.